Lately, I've been getting flooded with emails. I get so many that often I'll just go and hide in the garage rather than figure out how to respond. But recently I got one from a fellow named Poncho. And I knew right away how to respond to this one. He wanted to sell his Wagoneer. He was firm on the price, but the price was reasonable. Now he didn't send any photos, but he did tell me a little bit about the condition. My only question was, how many spare tires do I need to bring? So let's go pick it up. I've got tools, I got camera stuff, and I got a $2 bill. So I can pay this thing in full. I'm test fitting a GPS in the dash on this truck, so we'll see how that works. I'm going to top off my fuel tank here as I'm leaving and reset the trip meter. I'm about halfway now, stopped at a truck stop and they spoke my language. So it's time for a trailer picnic. Back on the road again. I'm probably going to be late. Now I've never seen a single picture of this Jeep. I'm buying a completely sight unseen. I'm not going to go wrong at this price. And this is it. It is a six cylinder. These originally had an overhead cam straight six. It's a manual transmission so I can see a clutch cylinder. So that's always good. Let's see. Tires are probably hold air. They actually made these in two-wheel drive versions, but this is a 4x4 one. See a leaf spring in the back? That's always a good sign. That's a cool hitch. That was registered in 96. Now we gotta sneak this thing out of here. That's more promising. This seems like a good place to check the trailer. I saw some neat cars leaving. I think it's some kind of sports car track day. This is a road course and drag strip all in one. Now the pickup truck seems a little out of place here. I made a nice break from driving. As soon as it was time to get on the road again. We're going to fill up again and see how much fuel we actually used. It was 254 miles. And just over 12 gallons. Made it back, no problems. Even most of the vines survived. Those are really on there. I haven't really looked at this thoroughly. I just 
picked it up. So let's take a better look at it. Need a taillight lens. This vine survived too. We have a little Swiss cheese going. Oh yeah, that's not structural at all. And then up top here, down this whole edge, definitely have extra ventilation here. I like those backup lights. That doesn't look normal. Tourista 1971. Gun rack. Oh. Well then. Yeah. I'm just gonna not deal with that right now. Back seat doesn't look half bad. It's got an ashtray in the front seat for the back seat passengers. Don't want to be without that. I like the embossed emblem in there. Looks like the emblem's all over the place here. Spare ignition stuff, always a good sign. Oil pressure. It's in kilograms per centimeter in the big numbers and pounds per square inch in the small ones. Great blue coil. So it probably has ignition problems. I like that system. Off, air, defrost, and two vents here. It just seems older vehicles have more style. And more ashtrays. I'm thinking three speed. We'll have to get into that glove box. Hey, a hubcap. Selectro hubs. Huh. Feel like they'll work. I like the grip on those. That's nice. That is just one tiny little axle. I think that's a Dana 27. Let's see what this tag says. 4.27 ratio. We've got overload springs on it, bolted on. We have big dents in the oil pan. That engine and axle combination is not good. The differential and oil pan have definitely had a conversation there. Right above this differential is the fuel pump. And these little hold down clamps normally clamp a glass sediment bowl on the bottom of the pump. I'm wondering when the differential hit the pan, if it also smashed that glass bowl. Someone did try to raise the engine up a little bit with some washers. That is interesting. It's just a threaded end with a grease fitting. Obviously it was meant to do something else. Maybe it was a stabilizer and that was hitting the engine also. They just removed it. The leaf spring is hitting the tie rod. Looks like the shackle got tweaked that way a little bit. Looking at all the torch marks that made this, those are homemade shackles. Good spare tire. Here's a little rear end. This rear axle should be a Dana 44 rear end, which is normally found on the front of full size vehicles. That looks like 47-11, which should mean 47 teeth on the ring gear and 11 teeth on the pinion gear. 4.27 to one ratio. Looks like a 44-1, confirming it's a Dana 44. But this is really interesting. Use limited slip lube only. That's a limited slip in there. That's nice to have. And that pumpkin is offset that way. I thought we'd have an offset transfer case, but we don't. Looks like the drive shaft is running at an angle, not just up and down, but side to side. Looking away the transfer cases in there and the way it doesn't match the rear end, I'm wondering if they swapped the whole engine tranny transfer case from something else in it. I was about to say it has real fancy spark plug wires, but they're all cracked. Oh, we also have a missing spark plug. That's not a good sign. Cap is off. We got points, so this is probably early 70s, late 60s. Ah, yes. The Jeep windshield washer bag. We'll just reattach that. Comes with spare scrap metal. Let's see if that manifold number can help me. I'm gonna look up that block casting number. This stamping filled in the exact details. The nine at the beginning was what year it was made. Next two digits were the month. Then the engine code letter, showing it being a 232. And then the last two digits are the day it was made. That was made on June 15th, 1967. That is some quality hole drilling on these motor mounts. There's a motor mount right here on a front plate. And then another motor mount back here. I wonder why they did two of them. This side just has the one. No additional mount. That alternator is really crammed in there. Now this transfer case it has the backing plate for a drum brake emergency brake on the output shaft. I thought this indicated that they had swapped out the transfer case and didn't need this emergency brake anymore. But on these rear drum brakes, there's no provision for an emergency brake cable. Apparently, it was intentional to have the emergency brake not work. I'm not 100% sure that the factory put hose clamps to hold their slave cylinders together. Looks like that might just be holding the return spring on. I like the gasket here. Let's see what transmission this has. 
There is the transmission number. Now I'm a bit more confused about this thing. I really thought someone had just taken the parts from a later 60s model Wagoneer, the engine, transmission, and transfer case. The engine would have been a 232. The transfer case would have been a Model 20. But the transmission should have been a T14. The T90 is the model transmission that the 64 had behind the overhead cam six cylinder. Now to add to the mystery, this T90 is a top shift. But this Jeep originally came with a column shifter. This is where the shift lever would have sticking out. And under the hood, this is the end of the steering column. These are the levers that would have operated the transmission. So clearly this Jeep came with a different transmission. So we have an engine that's definitely not factory, a transmission that is the right model that could have been factory, but a different shifter, a transfer case that may or may not have been factory, and the axles probably are the ones that came in this. I kind of like it. That makes it interesting. Let's see if there's any oil at all in here. Oh, there's oil and it's right about in the right area. That's good. What are the chances it turns over by hand? It turns over. It has very little compression. It turns over really easy. The next step is to see if we can get this thing running. Now this doesn't surprise me at all. We have two wires, a black one and a red one. The black one goes to the solenoid, so that'll be the positive. The red one goes to the block, so that'll be the negative. I don't see why people do it any other way. We're gonna see if we have a working starter. Heard a click. Yep, we got a working starter. Probably a dead battery too. That's the one I use to do all the winching. Let me throw a charger on that. I can go figure out what spark plug it uses, but that requires going inside and looking it up. I'm gonna pull the one next to it and compare. Let's look at the bin and see what we got that looks similar to this one I just pulled out. Like this one. Yep, that looks like it'll work. I pulled out this ignition cap I found in the interior. There's eight spark plug wires on there. So that is definitely not from this engine, but I could steal a wire from it. As a general rule of thumb, if you have a point ignition and it doesn't work, it's probably the points. They go bad pretty often. You know, I think I'm going to pop them out of here. Those points are absolutely toasted. Now you can see there's big pits on one side. There's a big lump of stuff that's welded in on the other. When I ran the file through, something felt like it was catching. It's that big lump of stuff. So these points are absolutely shot. So let's make them work. This is the extreme points file, a thin cutoff wheel. I've gotten that one down to shiny metal. This one still has a pit in it, but it's not touching anyway because these are all out of alignment. In books that show you how to do points, they show that they have to be exactly parallel together. When they come in at some weird angle like this one does, those books will tell you that's exactly the wrong thing to do. I'm gonna use the points file just to get the shape about right. They're not gonna last long, but that doesn't worry me right now. We're gonna run a jumper wire right to the coil. I'm gonna check spark straight at the coil. <laughs> We made those points work. Another major problem we have here is we have no rotor. That's gonna be an issue. Maybe. Hmm, it probably has a rotor, but I doubt it's the right one. Here's a box of ignition stuff I got when I got that stove bolt Chevy engine. The cap looks very similar. Well, let's throw the Chevy one in and see what happens. The diameter looks pretty close. This has possibilities. It fits the shaft. I don't know if it's pointed the right way. Let's see if the cap fits. A Chevy rotor in there. And now I got this hooked to a spark plug. We got spark. That actually works. Well, now we need fuel. Some good old snowmobile gas. We'll put a good amount in there. Tried. Pour a little more in there. Trying to get some in the float bowl too. That runs. The two dollar Jeep runs. I'm pretty amazed.
hear some lifter noise, but I don't hear any actual knocking or anything that sounds like it's gonna come apart. It actually seems to run okay. Now we got it running, let's see if we can drive it. Got a stash of radiators here. Let's see if we can find one that's close enough. Now this is a radiator out of a four liter Jeep. And the four liter Jeep is a descendant of that 232. So this should work perfect, but it doesn't fit. There's the battery box and we're hitting there, which we will need a battery. We don't need the horns right now, but if I wiggle this around a little, it's still gonna hit the inner fender well. This is just far too wide to fit in there. I do have this radiator, which will fit pretty much anywhere. It'll overheat pretty quickly. At least it should be enough time to see if the engine's gonna stop smoking and what I wanna do with this vehicle. So let's slide that oh, anywhere in here. I've got the standard test radiator mounting system, zip ties holding it on, and old hoses inside other hoses, adapters. Now those are gonna blow off if the radiator pressurizes, but luckily I don't have a cap for this, so we don't have to worry about that. Looks like there's fluid leaking out of this clutch cylinder, which means there might be fluid in the clutch cylinder. Oh, that turned. By the level of corrosion on the cap, I was not expecting that to work. Well, there was fluid at one point, that's probably the right level of fluid. Let's see about the brakes. There's a large amount of rodent droppings in this vehicle. I think I might do a little cleanup. That should be good. Oh, I see rust floating to the top. That's always a good sign. I'm seeing that this carpet is attached to the pedal securely with some wire. I think I can delete this option. I kind of like that better. Somehow fuzzy pedals just don't do it for me. They use good wire for this. Three wires. There we go. That's better. The way this pedal's acting, you push it and it just drops. It doesn't feel like it's moving a piston at all. So it probably happens it went down and the piston stuck all the way in. Luckily on this clutch master cylinder, the piston is in line with the fitting. I'm gonna use these pedal pads to absorb the excess fluid. Wouldn't want to harm the paint at all. Now we can take a small punch and go through the hole at the end and get to that piston directly. Now I'm gonna go inside and push on the pedal and if that piston's moving, we should see this punch come out. Let's try to work it back and forth a little. I'm gonna try blowing air in backwards, see if I get bubbles out. Yep. Seems to be flowing. Found a fitting the same size, show some plastic tubing inside it. We're gonna see what's happening here. It looks like that's working like it should. So let's hook it back up. Now I'm gonna bleed it and see what happens. I've done a bit more bleeding and a lot more pumping. I think we might have a clutch pedal that works. I think the best way to clean this seat cover is by throwing it directly in the trash. So we're just gonna cut away all the mounting. You can tell it's an old seat cover. They actually have eyes crimped into the seat cover and then attached with string. Yeah, this is definitely the way to clean it. Well, I was just cleaning up the stuff in this area and I found a key. Let's see how lucky I am. Maybe not that lucky today. Two of the tires went flat in a matter of hours. So I'm just gonna air them up real quick. Figure the hole for a few more hours. I hooked up a little gas tank straight to the carburetor. That'll gravity feed some fuel in and we keep this running for a little longer. Radiator's leaking, but I'm okay with that. I can pour it in faster than it comes out. Let's hook up the ignition, try this thing out again. Broke my rotor. Apparently this wasn't quite close enough. More precisely, it was too close. The rotor hit something. I tried sanding off the end to get it to fit and turn, but it keeps popping over to the side now. 
Let's see how we can get into this glove box. The button's already broken off, so I'm going to see if I can twist and pull something to make this work. There we go. Oh, oh, whoa, 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 what do we have here? Ignition points? I should have opened this thing up earlier. Oh, they aren't good ones. These are old ones. Apparently someone's already replaced them. We're just going to use this convenient knife. Oh, there's a fork too. There is a missing spark plug. Really should have checked this earlier. Pretzel. Don't see a rotor though. I've been digging through every box of ignition stuff I have trying to find another rotor. So I really don't want to spend money on this. But I can't find one. What I did find was a headlight retaining ring. And here are two chrome trim rings. When we remove this headlight, also took the connector with them. I just attached spade connectors to each of the wires. I just need to figure out which one goes where. Now the white one's easy. That goes right to a ground. But the red and black, I think black is low and red is high beam. I don't remember exactly. But I pulled off this one and I can see the white one connects to this terminal, then black, then red. Now the headlight terminals are a little too big for the spade connectors. You gotta make them just a little bit smaller. We have white, then black, and then red. You could wrap some electrical tape around those to make sure they don't contact anything. But I got a big air space in there, so that'll be fine. I'm glad I saved the old headlamps from the bus when I did that LED swap, because otherwise I'd have to buy one. These things are getting kind of expensive. This ring doesn't quite fit right. Let's see if I can get a couple of holes to line up. Top one's the most important, because gravity. One of the tabs from the old headlight ring was still attached, so I'm going to use that as a washer since these holes don't quite line up. That hole doesn't line up at all. I'm going to sit this other one on top of it and it'll push the whole thing down. That'll work fine. This one was pretty close. I just use a small flat washer. Now these chrome trim rings are definitely not the ones that are supposed to be on here. By the angle they're at, I think these might have been off a VW Bug with the rounded fenders. I had a lot of those at one point. But we're going to see if we can make them work. Now it does have a hole in the bottom for a screw, and this has a place for a screw on the bottom. So already we're doing pretty well, but just bolting in the bottom, the whole top is floppy. This truck has a little section where you're supposed to have a tab that sticks into it. This does not have that tab, but it will in a minute. The edge here is curled over, so I'm just going to straighten that out. Just using a pair of pliers, grab it and pull it. Now the other thing is this ring is bigger, so this tab doesn't stick in there. So we got to bring this top edge down. Luckily, it's just metal. We'll just tweak it a little bit. So now that, that top edge catches, we can bring the other part down. And there we go. They're attached. If you look close, they're not right, but they're way better than they were before. The way this front end slopes down, that angle on the trim ring actually kind of works with it. Looks intentional-ish. I've got my rotor. AutoZone had it in stock for $3.79. That's almost double what this entire Jeep cost me. It looks almost identical, just a little shorter. Let's see what happens now. Pour a little juice in here. It's running again. Often when a vehicle has been sitting for a long time, the clutch will be stuck engaged. And the first shift will be rough, like that. Need more fuel. There's a knocking sound coming from this area, but as soon as I press on the clutch, it goes away immediately. Let out the clutch, it goes again. I'm expecting there might be an issue with the transmission, so I'm just ignoring it. Now it's time to see if this thing will drive. I just got a tube hooked to the float bowl vent. I'm filling that up directly because I think there's something wrong with the needle and seat. 
Seems like fuel's not getting from the tank in there, but right now the exhaust manifold's hot, and I don't want to open up that bowl on a hot exhaust manifold. I tried hitting the brake pedal. I felt like it was gonna do something once, and now it just flops. So I think it did the same thing, pushed the piston in, and it's staying there. I'm gonna try the same trick of taking off the fitting and pushing backwards, but I'm not hopeful on this one because there was no cap and it's pretty rusty inside. Yep, it's moving. It looks like the cylinder might be pumping, but that fluid does not look particularly good. Before I hook it to the rest of the system and pump this goop into the drums, I'm going to actually drain this whole thing into another jar and refill it with fresh stuff. At least then I won't be adding contaminants to the rest of the system. I'll just have the ones that are already there. When you punch backwards in the cylinder like this, there's a very high probability of damaging something inside. So it's still not hopeful, but at least it moves. Brakes still aren't really doing anything useful. I put air in these tires last night for the test drive and they're flat by morning. So I'm gonna do something about that. I'm gonna start here with this quick release wheel. One of the studs is broken off, so there's only four nuts to remove. We're gonna see how good the spare tire really is. Well, bolt turns. The wing nut isn't quite finger turnable, but it's not too bad. There we go. Someone ran wires in it. Undo the wires. There we go. That spare tire has been in there a while. I'm also noticing the rim doesn't have the mount for hubcaps, which this should have. And that's a 716. This is an old flat fender Jeep wheel. I could use those. There's a good sized snail on that wheel. Wonder how it got there. I noticed that these are left hand thread, which means someone probably tried to take it off, turning it the way they expect, and that's what snapped it. Now left hand thread is normal, but usually on the driver's side of the vehicle. This is the driver's side front wheel. These are left hand thread, like they're supposed to be on the driver's side. This is the driver's side back wheel. These are right hand thread. Someone had both rear drums off and got them mixed up and put them in on the wrong sides. Which means this vehicle probably had a brake job done at some point. So the brakes are probably fine. I'm sure it was recent. It fell pretty flat right out of there. So I'm gonna put a little air in it and see what happens. Got 20, I think that'll be fine. The tire seems a little taller. It wasn't until after I dropped the spare tire that I realized I didn't need to take that nut off. There's a slot on the end. You just lift it up and slide it in place. That's not bad. It looks like this is a spot where you can stick a tire iron to give you some leverage to do that motion. I like that design now. Now this front wheel on the passenger side is right hand thread. I bet whoever broke that stud off in the back probably felt bad about it, realizing they broke it just because they turned it the wrong way but I can totally understand how that happened. Now the front's gonna get that spare tire I brought with me. And I wanna show you this real quick, cause it's kinda neat. A buddy of mine gave me this recently. This is a brand new tire. You see all little nubs on it? And the size is a G78-15. If you don't recognize that size format, don't worry about it. These haven't been made in a few years. And by a few, I mean probably 50 or so. But it was found in a storage unit and the rubber still looks good. It's not really cracked, it's not really dried. It looks like a totally usable tire. Another thing that I thought was neat 
was it's a KM78. Hopefully you could see it on camera there. That sure looks like the Kmart logo to me. So is it possible this is a Kmart brand tire? If anyone knows more about that, please let me know in the comments. It's kind of curious. Now I know you're not supposed to have radial on one end of the car and bias ply tires on the other end because they move side to side differently and then both ends will handle different. But now I've got radial tires on the left and bias ply on the right. So I'm assuming that'll handle fine. Now that the engine's cool, I'm gonna take a crack at this fuel system. I'm gonna start right at the inlet. Remove the fuel line. The absolute first step is to make sure fuel actually comes out of it. Yep, we got fuel. That fuel line goes into a fitting on the side of the carburetor and that can be removed too. And there's the actual needle and seat. Looks like we can see through it, so we should be getting fuel out of that. So now we're gonna take the bowl off here, see what's happening inside of it. Really hope I don't rip a gasket. Oh, there was fuel, there was lots of fuel in there. I'm gonna reinstall this needle and seat. When this bowl fills up, the float rises and shuts off that needle. And that's what turns off the fuel flow. When it needs more, this drops down, that needle opens and you get fuel filling it up. There's the main jet right there. I'm gonna pop that out. This is what meters the amount of fuel that comes from this bowl and goes into the carburetor. So if this is clogged, we don't have enough fuel. You can see through it, this actually looks fine. I'm gonna do a quick carb cleaner rebuild. Basically spraying carb cleaner through any openings I find, make sure it flows through. I noticed a small hole on the side here. That's letting air straight into the carburetor. Maybe that's a vacuum port of some sort. There used to be a line connected to it. I think I'm gonna plug that up. I'm gonna hook this line back up. We're gonna test and see if I have enough gravity to make the fuel flow. Previously, I had the tank right around this area, which is above the carburetor, but maybe there wasn't quite enough pressure. So I'm gonna take the tank and lift up more. We got fuel, that shuts it off. That turns it on. I'm gonna mount this tank higher next time. And we're gonna plug that hole on the side. The gasket looked like it survived okay, so hopefully it'll reseal. I've got the fuel tank safely secured in a higher location. And I found a roll of electrical tape jammed in the horns here. Hopefully it has a little sticky left. The vacuum will help stick it on. Let's see how this works now. I'm gonna try a cold start on this. No dumping gas in, no pumping the gas pedal. I'm gonna turn on the choke just like normal. Ignition on, now I hit the button. <laughs> That's getting there. This thing wants to go. I can work with this. Now I gotta drive it around a little more. I also noticed at some point all the lifter noise went away. There's also a lot less smoke coming out the exhaust. I cleaned off the gauges so I could read them. Oil pressure looks fine. Oh yeah, no brakes. This is now officially a running and driving vehicle. A few minor inconveniences, you have to drive with the hood open and the brakes don't work at all, but it drives around. It's getting there. Well, that's it for this video, but not for this project. You're gonna see this one again. I actually was supposed to be doing something entirely different this week, but this one just called to me. I'm really glad I went and got it because this has a lot of things I look for. Vintage enough to be cool, the styling and the older mechanicals, but it's also already been modified and is in bad shape. So I get to have the fun of working on it, but not having to worry about keeping it original. Because it's a four door, once I get this cleaned up, I can bring my family with me. And that'll give me a lot more opportunities to drive it. And it was cheap. I really did buy it with that $2 bill. Getting it running driving got a lot more expensive. I'm up to six bucks. I know to get it on the road, even more money's gonna have to go into this thing. Luckily on something like this that I don't have to worry about keeping original, I can just use whatever parts I need, and I think I'll be able to keep the cost down pretty good. You'll find out soon, but no matter what, it'll be fun. Hope you're having fun too, and we'll see you next time. I just got back from Motor Vehicles, got my registration, insurance, and license plate. This thing is now officially road legal. 
Not exactly road worthy, but road legal. I just ordered $200 worth of parts, so we're gonna see if spending 100 times the purchase price in parts will make this road worthy. That'll be coming up in a little while.